Ladies and gentlemen, great writers speak to the intricate reality of their societies. And great writers manage to go from the particular to the universal, from the conditions rooted in a particular place and time to the issues of the human condition generally. Shakespeare was such a great writer. He addressed many aspects of the social and human reality that transcend the specifics of Elizabethan and Jacobean England. Thus the greatness of Shakespeare, attested to by his ability to speak to us through space and time, and from all cultures we go back to him for the projection of our dreams, for the unexpected echo of our inhibitions, for the expression of our fears, or the articulation of our hopes. He is the most universal writer in history. Some will say that there are so many new issues today that our time cannot be compared to past eras of our history. How could writers of times past, centuries ago, such as Shakespeare, have relevance to our times? Think of surrogate motherhood, war crimes, human rights, bioethics, multiculturalism and myriad challenges to individual behavior that Shakespeare could not even dream of. Surely the bard cannot be relevant in this day and age, they would say. I believe that he is. And by focusing on a specific case from his writings, I will demonstrate. And that case addresses a fairly contemporary question war crimes. That is not surprising, since we find that Shakespeare addressed many questions that are still of contemporary import, including interracial marriage and gender equity. Now, gender equity is certainly an issue of our times. It was only in the 1920s that women got the vote in the United States, and they remain discriminated against in almost every society to this day. As for interracial marriage, it was only in the 1960s that civil rights were attained for blacks, and to this day, only a very limited percentage of blacks marry whites in the US. It was my intention to cover all that and more. I was going to provide you with examples of Shakespeare's concern for the status of women, where I differ with some of the feminist criticism that sees in him only the patriarchal social structure of his time. Because I agree with Ryan's new reading that shows the counter voice as present in the very fabric of the play. Interracial marriage and racism is clearly at the heart of Othello, as I have discussed elsewhere. But today, let me limit myself to the issue of wars and war crimes. Yes, war crimes. Let me go to one of Shakespeare's most glorious history plays, namely his inimitable Henry V. With the overthrow of Richard II by Henry Bolingbroke, the future Henry IV, the Plantagenet line of kings comes to an end in 1399, and the Lancaster line begins. Henry IV consolidates his rule, and his son, Henry V, was to take his power to new heights. But the houses of Lancaster and York, whose heraldic symbols were red and white roses respectively, were to fight for hegemony in what was to be known as the War of the Roses in a series of complicated episodes between 1455 and 1485, until another Henry, Henry Tudor, a remote Lancastrian and the future Henry VII, defeated the last Yorkist king, Richard III, in 1485. Henry VII was to establish the house of Tudor on the throne, and his son and granddaughter, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, would become two of the most famous monarchs in history. Elizabeth was to give her name to the whole Elizabethan age, and it was under her reign and that of her successor that Shakespeare would live and produce his plays. Henry V 
is therefore the second of the Lancaster House to rule England and is one of the most illustrious military monarchs in English history. As a young prince, he would put down rebellions against his father and would later claim the throne of France and fight in France a long series of brilliant military campaigns that were part of what was to be known to historians as the Hundred Years' War between France and England. Henry's victory at Agincourt is the pinnacle of these campaigns and remains one of the most impressive military engagements where a small English army defeated a French army many times its size, inflicting massive casualties and taking many prisoners while hardly losing any significant number of their own soldiers. This victory was decisive in paving the way for the Treaty of Troyes, which came after some five to six years of additional fighting and negotiating. Under that treaty, Henry V married Catherine of Valois, the daughter of the King of France, and thus secured the succession to the French throne for his future son, Henry VI, who was a mere baby two years later when his father, Henry V, died unexpectedly of dysentery at the age of 35. The baby, Henry VI, would be king of both France and England for about a year or so, until France's kings resumed their autonomous history and the wars between France and England continued. This, then, is the setting for many of the ten history plays of Shakespeare. The plays have obvious continuity. So we see young Prince Hal, the future Henry V, in the plays about his father, Henry IV. Now, the play itself, Henry V, is considered by many the most nationalistic of Shakespeare's plays where the young king is shown in the most splendid form and war itself is presumed to be glorified. Yet a closer reading of both the reality of history and the art of the play show a subtler and more nuanced reading as we have come to expect from the multi-layered, profound person that is Shakespeare. Indeed, the opening of the play is so powerful a passage that we are mesmerized into thinking that this is going to be a patriotic celebration of the great warrior king. For Shakespeare opens with the chorus saying, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene, then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But Shakespeare also sees a much bigger and richer reality. He does acknowledge the seductive power of the charismatic monarch and the powerful military conqueror, but he also recognizes the scheming and the greed that supports war. And he sees war from the point of view of the ordinary soldiers to whom he gives presence and voice in his play. And he also recognizes the horrors of the murder of captives and unarmed civilians whose humanity he underscores. But before discussing the play, let me just mention some facts about the dust of the deed or deeds that cast shadows over Henry V's reputation and historical standing. So what are the facts? Henry V was a brilliant but ruthless military commander. When in 1415 at Agincourt, he was concerned that his small army had captured many prisoners who might turn on their captors, he had them executed a revolting act by the standards of his own time. The English knights refused to participate in the deed, and Henry used archers and simple yeoman soldiers to kill the prisoners. The exact numbers of murdered prisoners is contested, 
but it was probably between one and two thousand. It was not done in a fit of anger because the French had attacked the English camp and killed children and women there as that French attack would occur later. And incidentally, it was an event for which the Dauphin of France subsequently punished those who committed it. But the murder of the prisoners in Agincourt was not an isolated event. Two years later, in 1417, Henry was laying siege to the city of Rouen, the population inside the walls of Rouen, starving and unable to support the women and children of the town, forced them out through the gates, expecting that Henry would give them safe passage through his besieging army. However, Henry refused and the expelled women and children died of starvation in the ditches surrounding the town. From the perspective of French historians, this siege casts an even darker shadow on the reputation of the king than his order to murder the French prisoners at Agincourt. Now let us turn back to this great play about the warrior king, his military campaigns and his glorious victories. It contains some of the most stirring lines in English dramatic poetry, but also shows how Shakespeare was fully aware of the reality of war. Now we know that by what Shakespeare wrote elsewhere about the horrors of war with words that have entered the everyday language, such as expressions as cry havoc or let slip the dogs of war were first coined by the bard in his play Julius Caesar. For here, after the murder of Caesar, Mark Antony and Octavian are about to wage war against the conspirators led by Brutus and Cassius, and Antony predicts that it shall be terrible. And he speaks with words that mesmerize us to this day. Blood and destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar, that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war, all pity choked with the custom of fell deeds. Horrors so unimaginable that only the numbness of familiarity will enable us to endure them. The custom of fell deeds that shall choke out even the pity of mothers watching their own children die. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carry on men groaning for burial carry on men groaning for burial? Who could have imagined the horrors of the Holocaust, the killing fields from the Somme and Verdun in World War I, to the wholesale slaughter of World War II, to the massacres of Cambodia, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and beyond? Shakespeare's powerful words, potent images, and beautifully crafted phrases echo through the centuries to censure such actions in our midst. So, Shakespeare is fully aware of the terrible reality of war and he is fully conscious that the price is invariably paid mostly by the poor soldiers who get neither glory nor fame, not to mention the civilians who suffer in such circumstances. And in Henry V, Shakespeare goes beyond the charisma of his protagonist and gives space and voice to the ordinary soldiers and their doubts. He shows their concern for their families and for survival. He shows their doubts about the honesty of their leader and the value of the cause that they are risking their lives to support. In one famous scene, he has Henry mingle with the men incognito. On the eve of the battle, Henry is patrolling the troops in his disguise and he is told by Williams, a soldier who is unaware that he is speaking to the king. If the cause be not good, I am afeard there are few die well that die in battle. And Henry defends the right of the king to lead his men in battle. We are witness to a suspicion that some of his men harbor doubts about the sincerity of his declarations. Thus, when Henry still incognito declares, I myself heard the king say, that he would not be ransomed. <laughs> and William retorts, aye, he said so, to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, 
he may be ransomed and we never the wiser. Indeed, Shakespeare goes further. While celebrating the great victories of Henry V, he casts doubt on the merit of his claim to the throne of France and to the entire enterprise of war. So devastating is that is the suspicion that Shakespeare casts that the whole enterprise is intended only to keep the local population focused on foreign enemies rather than the quality of governance at home. It appears in part two of Henry IV when the dying Henry IV advises the future Henry V. Be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. This then is picked up again in the opening scene of the play Henry V, where Canterbury and Eli discuss a bill pending in the House of Commons that would cause the loss of half of the church's property. And they propose to subsidize the king's war in France so that he would mitigate the bill. Now, as Sutherland and Watts point out in their works, Shakespeare did not have to provide that opening scene, but he did. And the presence of that scene, showing that the church's support for his claim was a mercenary affair, then has particular relevance to the statements of Williams about if the cause be not good, we will have died in vain. Now, all this is not to say that Shakespeare was a peace activist or anti-militaristic. It is to show that this supreme dramatist and insightful observer of the human condition was not blinded by glory or hero worship and could see the unpleasant realities and had the courage to show them right alongside the ringing words that he gives Henry V, especially in the famous lines he has him deliver as he tries to encourage his men to go through a breach, a gap in the wall of the city of Harfleur, held by the French and under siege by the British army. Henry was encouraging his troops to attack again and again the city and deliver one of the most famous orations in all of English literature. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as mother's stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. On until he reaches on, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war proof, fathers like so many Alexanders have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers, now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit and upon this charge Cry God for Harry, England, and St. George. The eloquence of that speech, the eloquence that Shakespeare endows Henry V with, is such that his words continue to inspire Englishmen centuries later. As a brilliant leader, Henry knew how to get the best out of his men. And he, the king, promised those who would fight on St. Crispin's Day, no matter if they were of low birth, that they would be considered as gentlemen and that they would be his brothers to the end of time. That is the story of St. Crispin's. And he says, the king to his men, the story shall be a good man teach his son and Crispin, Crispin shall never go by from this day to the end of the world 
but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ever so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed. Accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, was any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. On that same battle, on the evening of that same battle, the famous battle of Agincourt, where that small number of English uh, 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 fighting men destroyed a much bigger French army, his men were concerned about their small numbers in facing a far larger army. And he tells his men that because they are so few, the honor will be all the greater that they will gain from it. And that he himself would have no more people because glory will be so much greater for the smaller number. And he says, if we are marked to die, we are now to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I'm not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. Can a man who speaks so eloquently of honor and glory actually commit base and wrongful deeds that would even be classified as war crimes? And even on that very day of St. Crispin, that the Battle of Agincourt would be fought? War crimes? Well, yes. On October 25th, 1415, Henry V had taken many French prisoners and fearing an enemy counterattack, ruthlessly ordered that the prisoners be killed. Now this act was contrary to the rules of war even in his own time and would without doubt constitute a war crime today. In fact, the English knights refused to carry out the order and the king had to use the ordinary soldiers to execute the prisoners. The fact that the French also committed atrocities, including the killing of boys and civilians, was not known to Henry at the time he gave the order, and it cannot be used as an excuse for his order. Furthermore, it is known that the French who participated in this action were subsequently punished by the French, and some served time in prison and would have been killed by the Dauphin of France had he lived. Now this sad blot on the glorious campaign of Henry V has been a severe embarrassment to many English historians and is seldom known to any but the most specialized of researchers. Now surprisingly, Shakespeare did not avoid this incident. It does appear in the play. Its presence was difficult for all those who presented the play and in both the films by Olivier in 1944 and by Branagh in 1989, the director simply cut it out of the production. The public hardly ever gets to see this aspect of the play. A rare exception was the New York production of the play in the mid-1990s. Indeed, Shakespeare recounts the incident in a very special way. In Act 4, Scene 4, Pistol, an ordinary soldier, the boy, and the French prisoner appear on the stage and proceed to a burlesque dialogue with the boy acting as interpreter, ending in the guarantee of the safety of the prisoner, a certain Monsieur Le Fer, by Pistol, who promises him safekeeping in exchange for a ransom of 200 crowns. Here's some of that dialogue. The French shoulder starts, Oh, je vous supplie, pour l'amour de Dieu, me pardonnez. Je suis gentilhomme de bonne maison. Gardez ma vie, et je vous donnerai 200 écus. Pistol doesn't understand, so he turns to the boy. What are his words? 
And the boy says, he prays you to save his life. He is a gentleman of good house, and for his ransom he will give you 200 crowns. Pistol says, tell him my fury shall abate, and I the crowns will take. Now, the French soldier is so grateful. Sur mes genoux, je vous donne mille remerciements. Je m'estime heureux que je suis tombé entre les mains d'un chevalier. Je pense le plus brave, le plus brillant et très distingué seigneur d'Angleterre. Pistol again turns to the boy and says, expound unto me, boy. And the boy translates, he gives you upon his knees a thousand thanks and he esteems himself happy that he has fallen unto the hands of one as he thinks, the most brave, valorous and thrice worthy seigneurs of England. Pistol, as I suck blood, I will some mercy show, follow me. And the boy says, suivez le grand capitaine. Now, this strange device gives pause. Why would Shakespeare introduce this scene? I believe that it is to give a human face to the prisoners, to show their fear and to establish a link between the captive and the captor. And this makes the subsequent act of murder by royal decree appear truly monstrous. Indeed, in the New York production, the actual killing of Le Fer by Pistol, who was not a knight, was shown on stage behind the king in response to his order. And while some may disagree with carrying this to the extreme opposite from what others like Olivier and Brana have done on total excision of the scene, a careful reading of the text, the original text of Shakespeare, yields no stage instruction that would contravene this rendering. But let us return to the construction of the play. Following this scene four with Le Pistol, Le Fer and the boy, in scene five we see the French concerned about losing the day. Now, here, note, rather than talking of dastardly deeds, they speak of dying with honor. It shows the French talking of committing themselves to die in the field of battle. But no French massacre is shown nor is the order to commit it given on stage. It shall be reported on later, but the French order to commit it is not shown. But here's what they say. Bourbon says, the devil take order now, I'll to the throng, let life be short, else shame will be too long. Now, this you will concede, are strange lines to give the French if they are to be painted as villains in this affair. In scene six, the king enters with prisoner in tow, and it is clear that the day is being won by British arms. Yet the king is aware that the fighting is not done, for the French have not yet cleared from the field, and he is worried that he has many prisoners and few men to control them. At the end of the scene, the king speaks thus. But hark, what new alarm is the same? The French have reinforced their scattered men. Then every soldier kill his prisoners, give the word through. Note that Shakespeare shows the king calm and collected, giving this order as a precautionary military decision, not in a fit of anger as later apologists would try to make it out to be. Indeed, Shakespeare goes further. He explicitly shows that the French atrocities are known only later and used as an excuse by writing in a separate and subtle scene immediately following the order of the slaughter. In the following scene, scene seven, Flewellen and Gower report on the atrocities of the French. They then try to link these atrocities to the act of the king, justifying ex post his monstrous decision. Flewellen says, kill the poison, and the luggage? It is expressly against the law of arms. It is an arrant piece of knavery. Back you now, as can be offered in your conscience. Now is it not? And Gower says, it is certain there is not a boy alive, and the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle have done this slaughter. Besides, they have burned and carried away. And that was in the king's tent. Wherefore, the king most worthy hath caused every soldier to cast his prisoner's throat. Oh, it is a gallant king. 
So the story is spreading that the king, in fact, gave the order to murder the prisoners as a retaliation to what was done to the English camp by the French. But Shakespeare has carefully shown by the sequence that it was not so. In fact, some 40 lines later, Henry appears to learn of the French atrocities and says that this is the first time that he is truly angry since setting foot in France and promises that there shall be no quarter given, a battle to the death is to ensue. Henry says, I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. Take a trumpet, herald, ride thou unto the horsemen and yond hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down or void the field. They do offend our sights. If they will do neither, we will come to them and make them scur away as swift as stones in force from the old Assyrian slings. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have and not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go and tell them so. Now it's important to note here that Shakespeare could easily have changed the sequence of the king's order to come after the knowledge of the French atrocities. But he chose not to do so. Indeed, by placing the dialogue of Llewellyn and Gower after the order and before the anger of the king, he subtly repudiates the British efforts at justification of the act as a reprisal. By linking it to the humanity of the prisoner Le Fer, he underscores the full monstrosity of the order. Now, this is the multi-layered Shakespeare who speaks to us across space and time. This is the writer who can recognize the attractiveness of the charismatic warrior kings from Alexander to Napoleon and their ability to capture our imaginations while at the same time reminding us of the horror of war and the ugly side of their enterprises. He gives us time to see the view from the vantage point of the average soldier concerned with survival not just the generals bent on glory. In this play, he shows us the soldiers' doubts about the value of the cause and the honesty of the king who leads them. It simply shows that Shakespeare was a supreme dramatist and insightful observer of human nature. Shakespeare understood human nature and the human condition, and was not blinded by glory or hero worship, and could see the unpleasant realities, and had the courage to show them right alongside the ringing words he gives Henry V before Harfleur and Agincourt, once more unto the breach, etc. So we can say that Shakespeare, if he recognizes the seductive power of charismatic military conquerors, and if he gives eloquence to this powerful king, he does not lose sight of the more complex issues at hand. For in a devastating way, Shakespeare also chooses to underscore how fleeting were the results of the campaigns of Henry V. He died early, and though he left his infant son Henry VI as king of both France and England, it was to be short-lived. The gains he made in France were lost, and England itself, which he had consolidated, was again driven by civil war. And Shakespeare gives the play this telling epilogue, for some even sarcastic episode. This star of England, fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved, and of it left his son, imperial lord, Henry the sixth infant bands crowned king of France and England did this king succeed whose state so many had the managing that they lost France and made his England bleed. So here it is, a play operating on at least three levels. First, the action at the level of the big battles and historic decisions, which is the standard level at which most audiences see the play or read the history of the glorious campaigns of Henry V culminating in the Battle of Agincourt 
where a small British army inflicted a massive defeat on a French army six times larger than itself, losing only 400 English dead against over 7,000 French killed, including the murdered prisoners, and another 2,000 prisoners after the slaying of the other captives. Second, at the level of the average soldiers, Pistol, Williams and the rest, giving the human level of the drama that is unfolding. Distant from the grand historic events, worried more about their mere survival, these all too human voices are not the ones recorded by historians. Yet it is here that Shakespeare brings out the full impact of war and its horrors, all the more forcefully for being so understated. It is at that level that the prisoners are brought to life with pistol and le fer. And the horror of the killing of civilians is given a human voice by the face of the boy who translates for them, who implicitly would be one among those murdered by the French in their own attack on the boys and the civilians. Sir, at the level of the underlying designs of the decision makers, where doubt is cast on the entire enterprise by showing from the second part of Henry IV the possibility of the whole adventure being just to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. On to the mercenary motives for the church's support for Henry's claim to the throne of France, on to the dismissive final epilogue that shows how short-lived these gains were despite their enormous price in blood. What makes the reading of the play so potent is the realization that Shakespeare had to greatly simplify the storyline. He summarized the complicated campaign to just three events. The siege of the city of Harfleur, where Henry, Henry says once more unto the breach once more. The battle of Agincourt, where the war crime occurs, and the Treaty of Troyes, or Troyes in the play, the successful negotiations seem to immediately follow the victory at Agincourt without the abortive negotiations, additional fighting, endless discussions, and additional years of fighting, five to six years actually, between the two events, which are fully reported in Hollinshead's Chronicles, who most of us believe was Shakespeare's major historical source. Now, given this necessary simplification of the major plot and the selectivity of the events that Shakespeare had to put into it, it becomes even more important to recognize what he did choose to put in. The scenes we discussed are obviously part of the design of Shakespeare to temper his portrait of the king referred to by others as a pattern of princehood, a lodestar in honor, a mirror of magnificence in Hollinshead Chronicles. Again, it is this ambiguity, this multifaceted reality of Shakespeare's work that intrigues us to this day. It is the complexity, so human, that the supreme craftsman injects into his plays and his characters that have helped his work transcend space and time. Today, as we look to the horrors of wars all around us, as we listen to the war crimes tribunal in The Hague, as we think of many horrible acts that need to be censured, as we listen to those who would find excuses to the murder of innocents and talk of collateral damage, as we see jingoistic fervor replace reason and see the courage required to speak of horrors committed by great powers against the weak. As we see all this, surely Shakespeare's rendering of the warrior king is one that deserves a second reading. The scenes we discussed are obviously part of the design of Shakespeare to temper his portrait of the king, a portrait that he painted with inimitable brushstrokes on the canvas of history. We could, in the same way, study 
usefully many of Shakespeare's history plays and the characters he brought to life in them. And we will find that, as T.S. Eliot said, every phrase and every sentence is an end and a beginning. Thank you.